Let us bow together in a word of prayer. And so God, we're thankful for your spirit that is greater than death, for the power of the resurrection that gives us hope in every circumstance and in every situation. We ask now that you be the preacher this morning, for if you do not speak, there's nothing the preacher can say. If you do not move, there's nothing that the preacher can do. God, you get every ounce of the glory. What we're after most of all is the blessing. In Christ's name we pray and let everybody say amen. amen. Again, I want to thank President Bolton for just this wonderful occasion. As many preachers as there are in this seminary, he had a roll call to call from, and I thank him for this gracious opportunity. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. The scene is tender, almost too tender for words. Maybe you have gone through it or will go through it soon enough, but the word comes that father has fallen ill. This is not a normal illness, for father is full of years, and the lump in one's throat, and the shortness of breath in your lungs indicates that this illness is probably unto death. In the book of Genesis, the 48th chapter, the first verse speaks of it this way. Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and went to Jacob. Jacob had made preparation for this final visit. And when he was told, your son Joseph is coming to you, he summoned his strength and sat up in bed. He summoned his strength and sat up in bed to give his final blessing. The scene is tender, almost too tender for words. I would imagine that upon Joseph and the grandkids' arrival, both Joseph and Jacob are fighting back the tears for they probably both know that this is the physical end. Some of you have gone through it. Some of you will go through it soon enough. The word came to Joseph that father has fallen ill and so he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim to see Jacob for probably the final time. The scene is too tender for words, almost beyond words. Why is this scene so tender? Why is it almost beyond words? Why is the deathbed visit almost too tender for words? Because despite uh, the abuses of some fathers, we look for the role of father in our lives. Father or mother, if you will, or mother has to be the father, but we look for the role of father in our lives. I was talking to Alan Bosak about the coming visit of Archbishop Desmond Tutu several months ago, and he said, Father is coming soon. It was the way that he said, Father, almost too tender for words, Father. It was the way that he led the Archbishop around this place in conversation, Father, almost too tender for words. When the Archbishop came, I understood what he meant. I understood that the archbishop was the father of his soul, the bishop of his soul. When the text says Jacob was gathered to his people, it means he was gathered to those who have fathered and mothered his soul. 
The rhetorical critic Michael Calvin McGee wrote an article long ago entitled, In Search of the People. I always think of McGee when I hear Dr. Martin Luther King say, we as a people will get to the promised land. Or we, the people, form a more perfect union. Or I listen to the speeches of politicians who claim that they are speaking and working for the American people. I always wonder who are the people that the speaker is referencing. When the text says that Jacob is gathered to his people, who are his people? Who are the collective group? that he talks about as making up his people. I want to do a riff on McGee and suggest that Father is the one who speaks to a deep and hidden longing in people. This is my translation of McGee, but a father finds a deep longing and champions it to victory. When we lose touch with our deep and our hidden longing, we lose our identity. Our deep longing is contained in texts, abstract concepts, maxims, an anal analogies, uh, symbols, and stories. But until someone comes and speaks them to us, names them to us, identifies to us what is before us in our own hidden eyes, we cannot know and cannot be a people because we do not know who we are. This charismatic leader, this champion, names our deepest longings. And our deepest longings are experienced as new, and we form identity around it and begin to mobilize ourselves. We call this champion a leader, a guide, a father, the father of the nation, the bishop of our souls. Jacob became the father of a nation when his name was changed and he was, he was called Israel. You remember Jacob? He is the son of Isaac and Rebekah, the grandson of Abraham and Sarah, the twin brother of Esau. You remember Jacob? He is married to Rachel and Leah and has 12 sons and several daughters, one in this text that we already mentioned named Joseph, who was the second command in Egypt. You remember J uh, Jacob? His name means trickster. It means heel. It means leg puller. He tricks his brother out of his birthright. He tricks his father for his brother's blessing. He is a heel. He is a leg puller. He is a manipulator. He is a trickster. As a result of his trickery and thievery, his brother Esau was angry with him and decided to kill him. His mother sent him to Uncle Laban's in Haran to let the heat die down. It was a long journey to Haran, and he found a place to sleep because the sun had set. He takes one of the stones and uses it for a pillow. He dreamed that there was a stairway set on the ground, and its top reached heaven. There were angels going up and coming down. And at the top of the ladder, he saw God, and God said to him that he would receive the land on which he was sleeping, and God would make his descendants like the dust of the earth in the north, the south, the east, and the west, and all the families of the earth would be blessed in his family. Jacob named the place Bethel, saying, Surely this is the house of God. Jacob continues the journey to Uncle Laban's house. Ultimately, after being tricked and misused by his Uncle Laban in the matter of Rachel and Leah and working extended years for his uncle, he returns the favor, operates in his trickster nature and tricks and misuses Uncle Laban. Uncle Laban pursues Jacob and because the Lord spoke to Laban not to harm Jacob, they reconcile. Jacob now departs crosses over into Canaan to return 
in reconciliation to his father. Jacob, as he crosses into Canaan, sends word to his brother Esau. He wants to reconcile. The report comes back that Esau is headed his way with 400 men and Jacob is fearful for his life and his family. That same night, worried and afraid, he arose. He sends his two wives and two maidservants and 11 children across the river. Along with the family, he sent everything he owned, cattle and all of his possessions. But Jacob stayed back, fearful, anxious, scared for his life, and desperate because of his past. All of a sudden, he is ambushed, he's attacked, he's waylaid, he's trapped, he's ensnared, he's assaulted. Something comes out of nowhere, so sudden, so momentous, so overwhelming, so unwanted, and so surprising. His first thought is this Esau, but he realizes that he's wrestling with God. Jacob says to the wrestler, you cannot leave until you bless me. The word bless literally means a transfer of strength. You can't leave until you transfer me some of your strength. The wrestler asked Jacob his name and he said, Jacob. The wrestler in turn says, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but now Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans, and you have prevailed. He gets a new name, Israel. Eugene Peterson translates Israel to mean God wrestler. Jacob has received the transfer of strength because he wrestled with God. He earned a new name. The change of Jacob's name presupposes the establishment of a nation. He was Jacob, a trickster, but now he is the founder of a nation. He was a heel and a leg puller, and now he is the father of 12 sons who gave rise to the 12 tribes. He is the father of a nation. And the promise that he saw on the ground has now been fulfilled. The years have passed now, and Joseph receives word that father is ill. Joseph brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to Jacob's bedside. Jacob gives forth the blessing to each, and in Genesis 49 and 1, he gives final instructions as to where he is to be buried. He wants to be buried with Abraham, with Sarah, with Isaac, with his wife Rebekah, and his wife Leah. The Bible says when he finished giving this charge, he draws his feet up into the bed, breathed, his last, and was gathered to his people. The scene is so tender, almost too tender for words. This is the gradual passing of way of one who is the father of our souls, one who has grown weak and old and feeble from the inevitable and the inexorable human process of deterioration and decay. The regal and royal father of a nation who lived a fulfilled life now belonged to and was numbered among the dead. He belongs now to the ancestors who have gone before and whose memory is preciously preserved. He is now gathered to the fathers and the mothers, the bishops of his own soul. His transition is peaceful, it's natural, it's beautiful in this text. The scene is tender, almost too tender for words. Jacob gave his final charge, lifted his feet into the bed, lay back on a pillow, breathed his last,
and was gathered to his people. And so we receive word that Father Mandela was ill. And the journey of Jacob is the journey of Nelson Mandela. He was considered by some to be a leg puller, a trickster, a terrorist, a communist. He wrestled with God for 27 years in a prison and came out the father of a nation. And when he came out of that prison, I'll never forget that day, such was his spiritual power that when he walked out, the entire earth shook. He was a God wrestler. And God changed his name. You shall no longer be called prisoner, but you will be called Madiba, father. You will no longer be called a terrorist, but you will be called uh, Mr. President. <laughs> you will no longer be called a communist. You will be called peacemaker. No longer prisoner 46664, six, six, but bishop of the soul of a nation. In his name, Madiba, he establishes a nation. He identifies to us what is before us in our own hidden eye. We cannot know and be a people because we do not know who we are. This charismatic leader, this champion, names our deepest longings. And we experience it as new and we form identity around these new names and we mobilize ourselves. He spoke and name the deep and hidden longings and champion them to victory, peace, freedom, forgiveness, and reconciliation. He is our leader, our guide, our father, the father of a worldwide nation. God said to him in prison, that he would receive the very land on which he was imprisoned. And God would make his descendants like the dust of the earth in the north, the south, the east, and the west. And all the families of the earth would be blessed in his family. And Jacob's promise which was Abraham's promise, is again fulfilled in Madiba. And so, on a warm and sunny day, December day in South Africa, our father finished giving his last charge. He drew his bed, his feet up into the bed, lay his head back on a pillow, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. In the words of Hamlet, or from Hamlet, this is Horatio, good night, sweet prince and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. In the words of the Christian tradition, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Thy rest awaits thee. And for those of us that remain, we make a promise. It's called Njalo. It means always. 
And now that we know who we are, we mobilize. Always we pray. Always we work. Always we bless. Always we forgive. Always, now that we know who we are, we say, Madiba, always. Always we laugh. Always we pray. Always we give. Always we love. Always we bless.